When discussing the causes of the secession of the Confederate States, you will find three different narratives prevalent throughout history. The first one is that the cause can be found overwhelmingly, or even exclusively, within the issue of slavery. The second one is a more legalistic and ideological argument about the concept of states' rights, whereas the third one is the lost cause narrative. It would probably be best to summarize each of these historical readings individually and to then investigate which one is the most believable. The slavery argument revolves around a deep economic dependency of the southern states on their cash crops, most notably cotton. This combines with a strong social element of what we might today call white supremacy. It was prevalent in all social layers of American society and necessitated racial discrimination to allow the southern system to sustain itself. Following this logic, it was economically, politically, and even culturally vital for the ruling class of the southern states to have slavery prevail. The slavery argument puts the blame of secession firmly on the south. The states' rights argument is more abstract and legalistic, and describes an ideological aversion of the southern states against executive and legislative overreach by the federal government. Following this argument, the Civil War was less caused by a racist culture and more so by a pragmatic Southern fear of becoming a political minority. Generally, advocates of the states' rights argument agree that slavery was the most pressing issue, but will insist that the secession was about a principle, not a particular policy. Thus, the states' rights argument distributes the blame of secession among both parties. Finally, the lost cause of the Confederacy lays out a narrative in which the South was acting in self-defense against not only political, but also cultural oppression by the northern states. Advocates of the lost cause reject the importance and legitimacy of the slavery issue and will instead point to a cultural struggle between the northern and southern ways of life. According to the lost cause, the southern states were pushed into independence by northern hostility. Thus, the lost cause puts the blame of secession firmly on the North. We should begin with the lost cause, as it is the easiest to discuss. The reason it is universally rejected by historians is that its evaluation of the importance of slavery is in direct contradiction to the sources provided by the Confederacy. The name Lost Cause was given to the narrative by one of its early proponents, Edward Alfred Pollard. Pollard wrote, the Lost Cause, A New Southern History of the War of the Confederates in 1866 and The Lost Cause Regained in 1868. In both, Pollard defends slavery as a commendable and appropriate part of Southern culture and depicts the North as the aggressive force in the issue. The books are a rather insightful attempt to weave into one another the effort to blame the outbreak of the Civil War on the North, to identify a distinct and noble Southern civilization separate from the North, and to make slavery appear as a justified or even harmless part of that civilization. It even dabbles in arguing that slavery was good for the slaves. These four positions, the northern aggression, the southern civilization, the justification of slavery, and the benefit of slavery, are central to the narrative of the lost cause. According to Pollard, the north was envious of the south, especially its alleged separate and superior civilization, and attempted to pin this envy onto slavery as an issue of animosity. Slavery, meanwhile, never did anything wrong to deserve this northern hatred and was instead hugely beneficial to the slaves and awarded them personal rights and individual indulgences. Also, slavery is good because cash crops make a lot of cash. What a hot take. But the initial premise of that hot take is that the North attempted to bring about an agitation of the issue of slavery, which was, according to the author, really just a side factor to the cultural division between North and South. Well, cool story bro, but you should have asked Confederate politicians how subordinate the cause of slavery really was. The first state to secede was South Carolina on 20th of December 1860. In its Declaration of Causes, it directly mentions slavery once every 121 words. How often does the declaration mention southern civilization or southern culture? Once overall, maybe, 
In one of the later paragraphs, the declaration complains that people who shouldn't be able to vote voted for the Republicans and thus were destructive of the South's belief and safety. That's a dog whistle, by the way, accusing the North of enfranchising African Americans to threaten slavery. Largely, black people did not have the votes even in the northern states. It was the white voters in the North who enabled the Republicans to take the White House. The second state to secede, Mississippi, on 9th of January 1861, is even a bit more explicit. Quote, Our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest in the world. Its labor supplies the product, which constitutes by far the largest and most important portions of commerce of the earth. These products are peculiar to the climate, verging on the tropical regions, and by an imperious law of nature, none but the black race can bear exposure to the tropical sun. These products have become necessities of the world, and a blow at slavery is a blow at commerce and civilization." End quote. Mississippi then goes on to list some of the historical events that provoked their independence including the Ordinance of 1787, the Hartford Convention of 1814, the Missouri Compromise of 1820, the alleged refusal of the federal government to protect ownership of slaves, the refusal of the Republican Party to admit new slave states, the alleged nullification of the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850, the advocacy of African-American equality by Northern abolitionists, and the encroachment on, quote, Southern security. All of these have to do with slavery, None of these have to do with some separate southern civilization. And just to show that I did not nitpick these two examples, Florida in its unpublished declaration of causes declares African Americans to be biologically predisposed to idleness, vagrancy and crime. Alabama denounces the Republican Party as avowedly hostile to the domestic institutions of Alabama. Georgia denounces racial equality, denounces the Republican Party, denounces them as treachery. Texas denounces racial equality on the basis that the servitude of the African race is the natural state of the African race. But, you know, at this point it's boring. We have hereby dismissed the lost cause. There was no separate southern civilization that was under some mysterious attack. So this leaves us with states' rights versus slavery. These two could be argued to be two sides of the same coin as the states' rights advocate will admit that the main privilege that was to be defended was in fact slavery, but that the specified privilege in question does not matter as much as the principle. So we now need to determine whether the specific policy or the overall principle are more important, and then we know which one of the two narratives is more accurate. It is true that the idea of states' rights precedes the immediate run-up of the American Civil War, and it in fact goes back to the creation of the US Constitution, Supporters of the states' rights narrative will point to incidents like the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions of 1798 and 1799, and then perhaps also to the nullification crisis of 1832. This did lead to fears that the federal government could outlaw slavery in the southern states without their consent. However, this was addressed by the Supreme Court in 1857 in Dred Scott v. Sanford. Not only did the Supreme Court deny African Americans the path to citizenship, it went a step further and overturned the Missouri Compromise, one of the main political complaints of many slave states. Furthermore, it determined that a blanket attempt of the US government to free the slaves would be a violation of the Fifth Amendment. In 1857, there was no further rational states' rights basis for the concern about the abolition of slavery. In fact, the judicial situation was so pro-slavery that there was a popular conspiracy theory in the North known as slave power, asserting that the slaveholding states had completely disproportionate overrepresentation in the US government. That means that the last remaining potential states right catalyst was a concern about the person of Abraham Lincoln, whose electoral victory in 1860 was the immediate call to action for southern states to initiate secession. But with the social strength of the slaveholding class reinforced by the power of the Supreme Court, Lincoln could not have abolished slavery even if he had wanted to. In 1860, there were 33 states, with Oregon the most recent one to be admitted. To abolish slavery, a constitutional amendment was required, and a constitutional amendment requires the approval of three quarters of the states, which would have been 25. That meant that for the amendment to become law, at most eight states would have been allowed to disagree with it. The eventual confederacy consisted of 11 states, and there were four more slave states that decided to remain in the Union. Those were 15 slave states in total, 
seven of which would have had to agree with the constitutional amendment to abolish slavery. That was not going to happen. The slave states were completely safe from abolition through an amendment. In fact, the actual amendment that abolished slavery, the 13th Amendment of 1865, only was able to pass into law after getting approval from 10 slave states. With that out of the way, to finally and truly isolate the two narratives of slavery and states' rights from each other, one would now need to show whether these southern states were consistent on the issue of states' rights. If they weren't, then the idea of states' rights can be dismissed and the narrative of slavery instead elevated as the accurate narrative. Ideally, there should be a document where the southern states have to decide between states' rights and slavery, and that document exists. It is the Confederate Constitution. If the southern states had truly cared so much about states' rights, then surely the Confederate Constitutions would have reflected this. The Confederate Constitution was independently ratified by the seven founding states of the CSA, and thus can be seen what they wanted out of their secession, and can therefore reflect on their views on the states' rights issue. Article 4, sections 2 and 3 can be clearly interpreted as a total protection of slavery on the territories of the entire Confederate states. Section 2, clause 1 specifically protects the ownership of slaves throughout the Confederate territory, thus making any theoretical attempt by a Confederate state to abolish slavery within its own borders futile. Slavery superseded states' rights within the very constitution the secessionists gave themselves. And thus, one of the narratives defeats the other two. The secession and the resulting civil war were caused by slavery. Every issue that fed into southern separatism, including those regularly cited by the pro-southern voices, was divided by just one degree of separation from slavery. Furthermore, the blame of secession is firmly on the southern states. They were not under any immediate threat from their northern counterparts. But those who choose to advocate the lost cause do not do so out of a desire for historical accuracy and education, but with the aim to deceive and stir the average citizen. Almost half of Americans believe that the Civil War was about states' rights rather than slavery. The main cause of this inaccurate historical knowledge appears to be the lack of appropriate and historically accurate teaching materials and the abundance of lost cause propaganda in school textbooks. But progress is being made. Only in 2018 did the state of Texas decide to teach slavery as the primary factor in southern secession. Although a century of propaganda can be hard to overcome, it is worth the struggle, for the sake of truth and for the sake of history. Thanks for watching.